In this video, we are going to cover the meaning and importance and significance of Rosh Hashanah. We're also going to dive into the insights, particularly related to the shofar and what it means when we hear it, when we sound it, and when we experience it at this amazing holiday, this amazing Yom Tov. And if you watch all the way to the end, there's a bonus because I'm going to share with you the mystery redemption, the mystery merit that we receive during Rosh Hashanah. It's going to blow you away and hopefully be a blessing to you. Well, shalom and welcome to Lapid Live. I am Rabbi Mordecai Griffin. I am so glad that you are with us tonight. And if you are new to the channel, then we want to invite you to subscribe to our channel. And of course, like the video, leave a little comment about what you're going to see this evening. So let's dive right in. What is Rosh Hashanah? Why do we keep it? What's, what's the purpose of this amazing Yom Tov? We're about to experience it very, very soon. It's coming up the first of Tishrei. It's a two-day event. So here it is. Rosh Hashanah is the birthday of the universe. Wow. I mean, right off the bat, it's something huge. We're talking about the birthday of creation, the day specifically when God created Adam and Eve. So you might be asking yourself, well, if it's the birthday of creation, why are we talking about the creation of Adam and Eve? That's a very, very good question. We're going to get to that in a second. But let's just leave it there for a moment. It's the birthday of the universe. It's the birthday of the creation of Adam and Eve. And it celebrates the head of the Jewish year. That's right. Our Jewish year in terms of counting of years begins in the fall, not in the winter, like many people are used to in our country here in the United States anyway. So this Yom Tov is called in the in, in the Psalms 81, 4 through 5. It says, blow the shofar at the moon's renewal, that is the new moon, at the time appointed, hidden for our festival days. Very interesting wording here. It says, because it is a decree for Israel, a judgment for the God of Yaakov. So here it is in Hebrew, just to to catch a few important words. It says, Tiku bechode shofar bekeser yom haginu. Now, the word it's for appointed time here is not the typical moed, but rather kise, a hidden time. This is, in fact, what the sages refer to as the hidden Yom Tov. Now, it's called that because this is the only holiday in Judaism and the Bible that occurs on the new moon. So in this case, the new the new moon uh, is speaking about the sliver of the moon. What does it mean when we say new moon? It means literally that the moon is concealed, that it's hidden, which means there is a concealment, a special essence to this Yom Tov that is different than any Yom Tov. In fact, the sages speak about Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah and the days in between called the Yamim Noraim, the days of awe. And they say that these holiday seasons, known as the High Holy Days, are unique among all the seasons of Israel in that they don't represent any type of natural phenomenon. In other words, they're entirely spiritual. We talk about the Passover, it represents our being naturally led out of Egypt. We talk about Shavuot, that has to do, um, by the way, I should mention, Passover also includes the barley harvest, the first fruits of the barley harvest. Then in Shavuot, we have the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And then at, at Sukkot, we're celebrating God's, uh, uh, you know, the fruit harvest and so on. So there's harvest, there's natural events that are taking place. But during the High Holy Days, there's nothing natural taking place. It's all all a celebration of the supernatural, of the spiritual. It's a time where we come in contact with heaven itself. As far as the Torah is concerned, let's go ahead and share a couple of verses related to this holiday as we read in the Torah. There are two principal uh, commandments, I should say, or Torah verses related to this uh, season. The first one is from the book, book of Vayikra, Le- Leviticus 23, 23 through 25. And it says, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, speak to B'nai Israel, saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you are to have a Shabbat rest, a memorial of the blowing of the Shofarot, a holy congregation. You are to do no regular work and you are to present an offering made by fire to Adonai. In scripture, this day is known as Yom Teruah, the day of the shofar blast, or more specifically, the day of shouting, because the word teruah 
means literally to shout. And so this is very important. Here on the table, we have a beautiful uh, ram's horn shofar. And I always like to point out that the shofar, if you just look at it, what is it? Well, in reality, it's, it's, it's flesh, ultimately. It's, it's a part of an animal. In this case, the part of a ram. But it's really just dead flesh. It's just flesh that's inanimate. Uh, it comes from an, an animal that presumably has been slaughtered. And so it doesn't become alive until what happens? Until we blow through it. And now the word for breath in Hebrew is ruach, the same word for spirit. So when, when we have breath or ruach that goes through this horn, suddenly it becomes alive and makes a very supernatural sound, which we're going to be talking about at length here in just a moment. The point that the reason I bring that out is the point is that we ourselves are shofarot. We are just dead flesh until the spirit of the living God breathes through us. And then we become a teruah. We become, become a shout. We shout to God. We bless his name. We give him our praise. And then we become every day that we think about it this way. Every day that we bless God is a yom teruah for us. Every day that we wake up and say, God, you're awesome. God, I love you. God, I thank you for restoring my soul within me. You've just blown a spiritual shofar unto him. So it says in the book of Numbers, chapter 29, verse 1, it says, On the first day of the seventh month, you are to have a sacred assembly. You are to do no laborious work. It is for you a day of sounding the shofar. So we see twice that the Torah tells us this is supposed to be a rest day. It's a special day. It's a judgment day. It is actually the beginning of the Yamim Norim, the days of awe. Uh, and Jewish idea, this is Resurrection Day. This is the day that sometime in the future, we pray this year, is the coming of the Mashiach and the beginning of the resurrection of the dead. And the blast of the shofar represents that call to life. That's one of the many things that it represents. We have in the Talmud, in Rosh Hashanah 16a, and also in 30, 34b, it says this. The Holy One, blessed be he, said, On Rosh Hashanah, recite before me verses that speak of God's sovereignty, remembrance of all the events, and the shofar blast, sovereignty so that you should make me your king, remembrance so that your remembrance should rise up before me for your benefit. And through what? Through what, how is this going to rise up before God? What is going to be the, the item or the, the thing or the instrument that brings the remembrance before Hashem? And the answer that the Talmud gives us is the shofar. So there's two things that are happening on Rosh Hashanah that are very, very important. First of all, we have to understand, understand the theme of the entire day. Uh, and the theme of that day is God's sovereignty. God is king. The, the other theme is it is a it is a definitely a day of judgment, not to the degree of Yom Kippur, but definitely the day of judgment. And it is also a day of Teshuvah. Again, not to the degree of Yom Kippur, but it's, it is definitely a day of Teshuvah. Now, why do I say not to the degree of Yom Kippur? Here's the answer. It is as if you are starting a court hearing. When the court hearing begins, judgment begins testimony begins, the trial begins, but the day of judgment, the day when the judge actually hands down the verdict, or in the case of a jury trial, the jury hands down a verdict, that day is definitely the judgment day, but it all began whenever the trial began. So Rosh Hashanah is our beginning of our trial before Hashem. Will our name be in the Lamb's Book of Life, or will it be Has Shalom, God forbid, in the Book of Death? Or how should we consider ourselves? Now, the answer to that question, whether we consider ourselves in the book of life or in the book of death, the sages all agree, no matter who you are, no matter what's going on in life, you should always consider yourself as being in the balance. So the birthday of creation, this is the day when Adam and Eve were created. Then the first day of creation was actually the 25th of Elul. That if we look at the calendar, God's calendar, the 25th of Elul is when God said, let there be light, which means six days later is the first of Tishrei. And that's when God made Adam and Eve. 
So the question is naturally, why is it then that the 25th of Ul is not Rosh Hashanah? Why is it the first of Tishrei? And the answer is that all of creation was meaningless if it wasn't for the creation of man. Because God made creation so that man could inhabit it and do what? Declare me king. That's what he said. Because God needed a being, so to speak, that would freely choose to make him king of their world. That's why we celebrate Rosh Hashanah on the birthday of the creation of Adam and Hava, because nothing mattered until man came into existence. Now, this is also significant because if you count the festivals properly, beginning with with Shabbat, that means that Rosh Hashanah is the sixth festival. Now, why is that significant? Because it celebrates the day when man, six, was created, which means that the next festival, supposed to lead into our Shabbat, was Yom, is Yom Kippur, which means it's number seven, and Yom Kippur is where we're made perfect. We go from perfection right into number eight, which is Sukkot, new beginnings. So that's the proper order. It's also significant to note that this is the day, as I said earlier, which is the day of resurrection in Jewish ideas. Now, Adam and Eve were brought up from the dirt, from the earth, from the dust of the earth. And God is going to bring mankind once again up from the dirt or the dust of the earth and resurrect man. From where he began, he is going to begin anew. Why was he going to do that? Because the first time God brought man into existence, it was perfect. There wasn't any problem. He brought Adam and Eve up and they were perfect human beings until they made an unfortunate choice to fall. And so God's going to go right back to his drawing board because his drawing board is perfect and he's going to resurrect us from the dust of the earth. Now, as I said earlier, this is the only festival that happens on a new moon. This is literally the festival where no man knows the day or the hour. Now, why do we say that? Because on this festival, because it happened on a new moon, there had to be witnesses that went before the great Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin had to certify the witnesses and verify that there was, in fact, a new moon. So no one knew if it was going to be this day or perhaps a little bit later the, 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 the next day or what have you. Literally, this was the festival when no man knew the day or the hour. Clearly, when Yeshua said the Son of Man will come, when no man knows the day or the hour, he was clearly talking about Rosh Hashanah. And by the way, that was was nothing necessarily new to the disciples' ears because everybody knew that it was at Rosh Hashanah when the king is crowned, when the shofar sounds and resurrection is supposed to happen. All Yeshua did was confirm that notion, that reality. As I said, it's also the day of resurrection. This is the day when man who was made from the dust will be remade from the dust, but this time in our glorified uh, bodies our new creation, which, by the way, is an entirely Jewish idea. On Yom Tov of Rosh Hashanah, you and I have an opportunity. We have something that's unique only to us as human beings, and that is the ability to make God our king. You know, one of the names of God that we say, and we use it a lot during prayer and pl- Uh, public reading of scripture, we say Adonai. When we're talking colloquially, we say Hashem. But we're talking in prayer to God, we say Adonai. What does Adonai mean? It literally means my Lord. We could say Adon, that would be appropriate. He is, after all, Lord. But the reason we say Adonai is because we want to emphatically state when we're talking to him privately and affectionately through prayer, is that you're my Lord. You're not just a Lord. You're not just the Lord. You are my Lord. At Rosh Hashanah, we have that very uh, opportunity before us to not just make him a king, but our king. We crown him. Now, there's an interesting insight that talks about the, the difference between a king and a ruler. A ruler is like a dictator. A ruler rules over his subjects, whether or not they want him to rule or not. That's the ruler. And it's interesting to me that there are certain um, uh translations of the brachas that use, instead of king of the universe, it uses ruler of the universe. And usually it comes from a mindset that has the Torah commandments as a burden. 
interesting because the word king means that it is a ruler, a sovereign that is ruling by the uh, by the the will of the people. Meaning the people want him to be king. In other words, they're loyal subjects. That's the difference between a king and a ruler. The people who want somebody to be their leader choose a king. The people who don't want somebody to be their ruler, they have a ruler over them. That's if that you can understand a difference. So we have the opportunity to choose and actually choosing is the wonderful gift that we have. There's an insight from an art school commentary that says the purpose of creation was so that there would be a species that was capable of freely choosing to recognize and obey God. Now it says if this creature were so to choose, it would be worthy of heavenly reward. And God wanted to confer his blessing on someone who had earned it by rising above temptation and choosing wisely. There had to be a being with the capacity, it says, to seek alternatives to seduction and to bypass physical drives and immoral temptations and choose right. In other words, God wanted you and I to rise above the temptations of this planet, the temptations of life, and choose him to be our king, not to just rule over us and dominate us, but rather for us to willingly choose him. So as one person said, man's greatness is in his power of choice. It says, because he can deny God, man's recognition of his sovereignty has value. Isn't that wonderful? Because you can choose God and you have the power, chasve shalom, to deny him, it makes your choice of him that much more valuable. Isn't that true when we have our spouses? They don't have to love us, but they choose to love us, and that makes their love that much more special to us. So the question becomes, how do you and I, during Rosh Hashanah, how can we possibly crown God king? I mean, after all, he's God. He created the heavens and the, and, and the universe. Uh, I mean, he created everything. He created the, from, from the smallest blade of glass, uh, grass to the, the largest planet in the sky. He created it all. So how are you and I going to crown him king? And so here's the answer. It says the fullness expression of kingship is the complete obedience of all of his subjects to the will of the monarch. Did you realize that just by showing up to Rosh Hashanah, you have placed the crown on God's head? Because you are being obedient to his will. A king's greatest measure, it says, of majesty comes when his subjects freely, intelligently, and enthusiastically choose to serve him. Do you understand that that's when the king has the greatest power? When his when his subjects are enthusiastic, when they want to follow him, when they love him with all their heart, and when they, they say, you are my king and there is no other, and that's when the king is really powerful. And my friends, what I'm trying to say here is that through our obedience, through our acceptance of God's will, that is how we crown him king. Now, one might ask, how do we know that Tishrei is the month in which we should celebrate the creation of of the universe? Well, the sages point out that you can take the word breshit, where it says in the beginning, you you can rearrange it and, and it can actually read on the first of Tishrei. But there's another meaning of Tishrei I want to share with you. So according to the, the Piskita Rabasai, the term Tishrei, it says, is derived from the Aramaic root Shin Reish Yud, which means to loosen, to untie, to, to dissolve. So Tishrei itself, the word itself, is a word that bespeaks of teshuva, of forgiveness. The whole point of us coming before God is to be judged, that's to be sure, but he longs to be merciful to us. How do we know that? Because it says in the book of Ezekiel, God rises to be kind to us. He rises to be merciful for us. He longs for an opportunity to pardon us. This is why the uh, history teaches us that the Jewish Sanhedrin looked for ways to acquit those who had been caught in crimes that involved the death penalty. 
They sought ways to acquit them. Yeshua is our advocate. And when we stand before the heavenly court, he is looking for ways to acquit us. So it says the name of the month implies that Rosh Hashanah dissolves and pardons our iniquities. So wait a minute. We just show up to Rosh Hashanah. We're just minding our own business and we are obedient enough to come to Rosh Hashanah. This year, Rosh Hashanah, the first day of Rosh Hashanah is on a Monday. That means we don't go to work. We take the day off and we come to a Rosh Hashanah service. Right there, we've crowned the king. And just by showing up, we've had our iniquities dissolved. (laughs) Wow. That's how merciful and awesome God is. So another insight says the word Tishrei also means you shall begin. Targum Onkelos actually interpreted it this way in the book of Deuteronomy 16.9. So the word itself means you shall begin. So the month of Tishrei is very much the month of new beginnings. So therefore, what does that mean? What's the extra uh, insight into that? It means that Tishrei is for you a particularly special month of new beginnings. Every month we have Rosh Hodesh, so we, every month we have the opportunity to do better. But Rosh Hashanah is special because it's the Rosh Hodesh of Rosh Hodeshim. It's really the time in which we can have an ultimate new beginning. Our new year is completely new. When we come out of, out of Yom Kippur, we are like newborn people. We're like new creations. We have the entire year uh, ahead of us. What happened last year was, well, last year. We have the, the entire year in front of us. So let's pivot for a second and talk about the shofar because the shofar is extremely special. It is a particularly anointed and particularly unique instrument. And so we're going to spend a few minutes talking about this particular uh, item here. So the Sadia Gaon enumerates 10 things that the shofar represents. We're just going to go through them quickly. Uh, there's so much we could share, and maybe we'll come back at some other point and, and do a more extended version of this, perhaps. But this is what he writes are the 10 things that the, rep- the shofar represents. First of all, it's the, rep- the anniversary of the creation of the world, the shofar blast. So you think about it this way. God began the world with a shofar blast, and he's going to renew the world with a shofar blast. We're going to learn why in just a second. Rosh Hashanah uh, begins at 10 days of repentance. So the shofar blast is a call to us to, hey, if you're not awake yet, it's time to wake up because the trial has begun. Number three, it says at Mount Sinai, the Jews shouted because why? Because they heard the voice of the shofar. So when Rosh Hashanah comes, we begin to hear God's voice. The shofar at number four, it says, reminds us of the admonition of the prophets and their call to repentance. So think about that. The shofar encompasses all the voices of the prophets, of the Nevi'im, calling us back to, to God's ways. Now think about that for a second, because if that's true, and it is, then it means that there's a unified voice because the shofar represents God's voice. So if if the prophets are telling us, come back to Torah, come back to the ways of God, then it means that God is saying that to us. And of course, we know that because the prophets only spoke what God said. Number five, the shofar reminds us to pray for the rebuilding of the destroyed temple. As it says in Jeremiah 19, 20, I shall not be silent for the sound of the shofar you have heard, O my soul, the shout of war. Destruction upon destruction has been proclaimed. So when we hear the shofar, we're reminded that we need to pray for the temple. We need to, what does that mean? Because we talked about this during the three weeks. It means we're praying for Mashiach to come. When we hear the shofar, we want that to be the shofar of Messiah Yeshua. The shofar number six is a ram's horn that reminds us of the binding of Isaac. We're going to come back to that because in just a minute because that is really the most significant thing. And notice it's number six. Number seven, the sound of the shofar inspires fear and trembling in the hearts of all who hear it. So it's supposed to engender a level of, of reverence, a level of fear in us that awakens us and shakes us to our core. Number eight, the shofar reminds us of the great and awesome day of judgment, which will happen in the future. Again, it's a call to the judgment throne of God. Number nine, the shofar reminds us 
of the long anticipated day of the ingathering of all the souls, as it says, and it will be on that day when he will blow a great shofar and they will come, those who were lost in the land of Assyria, those cast out in the land of Egypt, and they will bow to Adonai on the holy mountain in Jerusalem, Isaiah 27, 13. The shofar, finally, it's number 10. The shofar reminds us of the resurrection of the dead and awakens our belief in yearning for that day. It says in Isaiah 18 and verse 3, All inhabitants of the world and the dwellers of the earth, when he raises a banner upon the mountains, you shall see, and when he blows the shofar, you will hear. So we, my friends, are going to awaken from our grave, if if we're not uh, if we don't live until the coming of the Messiah, and I pray it's soon in our time, but if we don't live until the until the coming of the Messiah, our spiritual alarm clock is going to be the sounding of the shofar. That's going to what that's what's going to awaken us. This is why Messiah said, the, "My sheep hear my voice." Why? Because the voice of God is the voice of the shofar. Now, there's something else that the shofar does that's also extremely important. It confuses the Satan. Curse be he. There's an insight here that says when the Hasatan, curse be he, hears that the shofar is sounded more times than the Torah requires, because on Rosh Hashanah we, we blow it a hundred times, it says he becomes confused and becomes apprehensive because he begins to wonder if those additional sounds might not be the sound of the shofar of the Messiah. So when we blow the shofar, we confuse the enemy. I don't know about you, but I like the fact that the enemy might be confused uh, with respect to my life. Now, we said earlier that the shofar represents, uh, represents Isaac. So let me give you this insight here. And I'm, we're, we're not done with the shofar. We're going to come back to Cephas Emmet in, j- in just a second. <clears throat> but here's what it says in Taurus Hakonim. And I shall remember my covenant with Yaakov, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham, and I shall remember the land. It says Leviticus 26, 42. So the, it says, I shall, oh, I shall remember. Why does it not specify remembrance in connection with Isaac? It says, because God says, the ashes of Isaac are visible before me always. They gather together, lying atop the altar. So when it talks about the remembrance of the covenant of Abraham and the remembrance of the covenant of Yaakov, it doesn't say so with respect to Isaac because Isaac's sacrifice is always before Hashem. Now you might be asking yourself, wait a minute, Isaac Isaac wasn't sacrificed. He's he He got up from the altar, he lived. Yes, that's true. The ram was sacrificed in his place. And we learn from reading Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer that that ram was a supernatural ram that had been created 2,000 years before creation. It's the Mashiach. And when that ram was offered, the ashes of that ram God considered as if it had been Isaac. It was one and the same as far as he was concerned. As far as God was concerned, those ashes were in fact Isaac's ashes. They were, in fact, the ashes of the only begotten son. Nevertheless, we read in other sources that when Isaac and and Abraham left that scene, they were a bit disappointed because they were actually hoping that Isaac would be sacrificed and therefore resurrected and by that act would bring about the the resurrection and the geula and the the, the final redemption and, and, and the coming of the Mashiach. And that didn't happen because the sages point out that was to be left for another day, which means what? Which means there has to be another sacrifice of a son. If the original sacrifice of the son didn't happen, what was supposed to be happen, there had to be another one down the, down the road. But that's for another class. It says here in another insight that when we blow the shofar, what we're really doing is we're asking Hashem to remember Isaac. This is from a Jewish point of view. 
They were asking Hashem to remember Isaac. That's from a traditional Orthodox point of view. When Orthodox Jews go to the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, they are not saying to God, Hashem, I need you to look at my life. I need you to look at my deeds. I need you to look at my Torah observance. In fact, it's the exact opposite. Orthodox Jews say to Hashem, Hashem, I have nothing to offer you. And when you hear the shofar, please remember the binding of Isaac for my sake. Now, as Lapid Jews, we understand that the ultimate Akidah, the ultimate bound one, was Yeshua. So when we blow the shofar, we're saying, remember the only begotten son. But in this case, we're talking about Yeshua, who is the final and complete Akidah. So turning to Cephas Ames, we're going to look at a, a couple of insights here to, uh, to the shofar blast. On Rosh Hashanah, we did not make our ascent to, to Yerushalayim. Isn't that interesting that the pilgrimage festivals are Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. We don't go to Jerusalem during Rosh Hashanah or during Yom Kippur. Isn't that interesting? There's a really good reason why that is. It's because God knew in the future that we were not going to be able to make an ascension to the temple during those two high holy days, which are the most important days on the entire calendar, because those are the days where we get judged and receive forgiveness. But wait a minute. How can we receive forgiveness if we can't actually go to Jerusalem to the temple? And God says there's not going to be a temple, which is why I'm not going to mandate that you come there when there is a temple, because I need you to be able to come up to the temple even when there isn't a a temple. And here's the answer. Cephas Ms. writes, despite the absence of the pilgrims to Jerusalem on Rosh Hashanah, the shofar in its own in its own fashion transports the Jewish soul to the innermost sanctum of the base of Migdash, the Holy of Holies. When we hear the shofar, we actually get transported to the spiritual Kadosh HaKodeshim. This is why Hashem did not mandate that we come to Jerusalem because he said one day there won't be a Jerusalem that you can come to. I need you to come there through the voice of the shofar. It says the shofar enables us to perceive Hashem and to feel as if we were present at the site of the Beis HaMiddash. It transports the Jewish soul to the site of the Holy of Holies. It says though we can no longer embark on the annual Pilgrim's Festival of Jerusalem to perceive Hashem closely like we would if we were going to go to the temple. It says, We can just as effectively as ever be aware of Hashem from afar through the powerful intermediary of the shofar. Now that sentence from Cephas MS is very important because sometimes people will, will be told from a Jewish point of view that we don't believe, that Jews don't believe in an intermediary. But here, we just learn that the intermediary that actually brings us into the presence of Hashem is the shofar. Now, here's another insight to the shofar. The word shofar, it says, should be interpreted as being derived from shefer, which means beauty. You know, it says in the Tanakh, that we will say concerning the cornerstone, Chain, Chain. We say grace, grace, but actually it can be interpreted beauty, beauty. The cornerstone is beauty. The shofar is beauty. That's the point. Interestingly, if we talk about another aspect of the shofar, because we talked about the shofar brings us in the Holy of Holies. What's the purpose of the Holy of Holies? To bring atonement to our souls, to help us to become born again. The word for amniotic fluid in Hebrew is the word mi shafir. The word shafir in that, in that phrase, mi shafir, it's two words, which again means amniotic fluid, the amniotic fluid of the, of the female womb. That word shafir is the, is the root of it is shofar. So we talk about the shofar blast it is very much the amniotic fluid of the spirit realm. So wait a minute. When you come to Rosh Hashanah, just by showing up, you're crowning God king. Just by showing up, 
your sins are being dissolved. Just by showing up and hearing the shofar blast, you're being drawn into the amniotic fluid of the womb and therefore being born again. Another insight from Cephas MS. This says, the blowing of the shofar in Rosh Hashanah, we are reminded of our hidden inner capacity. This is the word kisei comes from. We just read in the Psalms earlier. It says, we're reminded of our inner capacity to raise up barriers to our spiritual growth. So we have another aspect of the shofar. Not only is it intended to, to bring us into a new dimension, not only is it intended to, to awaken us to life and to bring us to the Holy of Holies, to bring us to the amniotic fluid, but it's also intended to say, you know what? This coming year, you can raise above even what you did last year. There is no end to your potential in Hashem through Messiah Yeshua. Now, a couple more insights to this before we get to our bonus. I know you're waiting for the bonus, so hang on to the end. But here is a couple more insights. It says, concerning the the ashes of Isaac, it's from, from, from this perspective, the participation of Abraham and Isaac at the Akedah created his ashes. For he was truly sacrificed in every world but the material world. Only in the material world did the ram take his place, which means what? That he was sacrificed in every realm except for this one, which meant there was something left undone to do, which is why Yeshua had to come from the spiritual world to the material world in order to affect that. If you think about it, Abraham and Isaac left the material world and went to the spiritual world, so to speak. It says, God speaks of remembering his covenant with Abraham and Isaac, but the term remember is not associated. I'm sorry, I I meant to say God speaks of remembering his covenant with Abraham and Jacob, but the term remembering is not associated with Isaac. So it says, the word remember implies linking something that happened in the past, but is no longer present. This is why remembrance is not used about Isaac. One must remember what happened last week, last year, But when it comes to Isaac, those ashes are always before him. As one insight says, God promised to remember the covenant of Abraham and Yaakov, which he had been sealed many centuries before, but there was no need to bring the covenant of Isaac back from the past. Isaac's ashes are always before him. This is what it means, my friends, when it says Yeshua is ever making intercession before Hashem. There's no need to remember because he's always there making intercession. All right, here's the bonus. We've said a lot about Rosh Hashanah and the Spirit, and the intention of this video is to help every one of you have a a very important perspective when it comes to what is taking place on this, this important day. Because there's apples, and there's honey, and there's shofar, and there's special clothing, and it's happiness, Tosh Sleek Service, which we haven't even talked about really, but all the other wonderful things, but then you get a bonus, and that is the hidden merit of Rosh Hashanah, and here it is. Cephas MS brings down, although a major source of merit, the monthly renewal of Rosh Hodesh is not available, an even greater merit is. So normally we get merit through Rosh Chodesh. God grants us forgiveness through the the monthly transition, but on, on Rosh Hashanah, something's a little bit different. There's a greater merit. It says, albeit this merit is veiled, it's shrouded in obscurity, few people understand it or even realize it. In fact, it's far too sacred for Israel to just generally partake of. And as a result, it can only be exploited on Rosh Hashanah. Can't be really, can't be really fully exploited through the entire year. But on Rosh Hashanah, this special, unique merit is available. And here it is. It's the merit of Yosef. That's the secret merit of Rosh Hashanah the merit of Yosef. Now, why is that important? Because Messiah Yeshua is Messiah ben Yosef. He's that secret merit that came and suffered for our sins and later 
prayerfully soon in our time, will return as Messiah ben David. Cephas Ames continues in the comments and says, the difference between Rosh Hashanah and Rosh Hashanah is clearly one of degree. Rosh Hashanah being the most elevated and exalted of all the new moons. And that's why the relationship between Yosef and the other tribes is what it is. The other tribes, the Shevetim. The memory of the tribes, what it's saying here, what Cephas Ames brings down is that when the high priest would go in to minister to Hashem in the holy place, he would be wearing the breastplate that had all the tribes' names on it. Okay, But one, when he would go into the Holy of Holies on, on Yom Kippur, he would not have that nameplate uh, bearing on him. And that's because he was going in under the merit of Yosef. Because Yosef was above all of his tribes. That's what it meant when all the, all the leaves, all of the sheaves were bowed down to him. He rose above those tribes, not to rule and lord over them, but his merit would rise above and provide atonement for all of them. So it says, as Yaakov blesses him in Bereshit 49.26, it says, the blessing of your father surpassed. Let them be that is bestowed upon the head of Yosef. So Cephas MS brings down that on Rosh Hashanah, the day that is described as Be Kese, a day that is hidden, on that spiritual day of hiddenness, we invoke the most mysterious and esoteric source of merit. And he writes, that is the merit of Yosef Hazadik. Now, if that wasn't good enough, let me just conclude our time together with this. Rashi points out that the knife of the Akedah, the knife that Abraham used, or was going to use on his son Isaac, is called Ma'aklet Al-Sem Sesorel Choklim Matan Shekara. Why? It's machalet, which has the root, this particular root word, because the Jewish people consumed ochel, its reward. In other words, the knife that Abraham used to sacrifice his son, and remember, God considered it as if he had actually sacrificed him, was called the knife, using the word that had the root word of to consume, to eat, because Israel lives because we consume the sacrifice of Abraham's son. I want to thank you for joining me. If you've enjoyed this teaching, please leave a comment and say something below. Be sure and subscribe. Click the little uh, bell icon so that you can stay up to date on all of the wonderful material that we have coming forth. And always stay tuned because Hashem is always speaking and always sharing. And we want to be a part of that. And we want you to be a part of that. So God bless you. Thank you. Shalom. And may you have a happy new year. And may you be inscribed for life.